what's up everybody welcome back to another highly combustible reaction we're jumping into the next one on our history journey uh the staggering siege of harlem 1572-73 part of the 80 years war get over and show san roman history some love if you enjoyed it's coming at us from mikhail much much love i definitely appreciate the whole knowledge journey for real it's the step outside of music but it's a welcome step let's go On the 11th of December in 1572, a Spanish army under the command of Fadrique Álvarez de Toledo arrived at the Dutch town of Harlem. This marked the beginning of a siege characterized by subterranean warfare, cruelties on both sides, a sea battle. I don't want to be involved in no war that is subterranean warfare. I'm not going in no damn hole in the ground. You lost your mind. The Harlem mayor and the arming of citizens to defend their town. Most famous of all, a woman called Kenau Simons Dr. Hasselar. The Siege of Harlem was one of the most discussed and most vividly remembered sieges of the Eighty Years' War. There is a 2014 movie called Kenau, various stage plays, I just heard about that movie in the Discord, historical novels, and even a siege themed escape room in modern day Harlem. This is how contemporary historiography tells the story of the staggering siege of Harlem. In 1572, the Iron Duke Fernando Álvarez de Toledo, Duke of Alba and Governor of the Spanish Netherlands, launched a campaign in the name of the Catholic Spanish Crown to cut off the Protestant Dutch rebels from France, one of the main areas of Protestantism. He first took Valenciennes and then advanced to Mons. According to Christopher Duffy, an expert on siege warfare, it was in the Siege of Mons that for the first time a system of two trenches was used in the early modern period. One called circumvallation to enclose the attacked town and one contravallation to keep relief armies off. These siege lines were created by the engineer Chiappino Vitelli and they would become crucial for siege warfare for the next couple of centuries. On the 19th of September, Mons capitulated. The army of the rebels dissolved and Alba met little resistance when he advanced to punish the rebellious towns of the northern provinces. The Spaniards made a dreadful exemplum of the cities of Mechelen, Zutphen and Narden by plundering and by massacring many of the town's inhabitants. This caused several terrified rebel cities all over the Netherlands to open their gates to them, and the town of Harlem came within a whisker to do so as well. Harlem is situated in the heart of modern-day Holland, it held moderate views on religious affairs and had managed to escape the reformed iconoclasm that took place in 1566. Apart from the fear instilled by the Spanish bloodshed, many of the city's administrators didn't favor to rise in open revolt against the King of Spain, Philip II, so that they sent four men to Amsterdam to negotiate surrender with Don Fadrique, the son of the Duke of Alba. However, the commander of Harlem's defenses, Wigbold van Ripperda, strongly disapproved of these negotiations. He convinced the city guard to stay loyal to Willem of Orange, the leader of the Dutch revolt, who subsequently ordered the city's administration to be replaced by people adhering to his cause. As soon as the four delegates returned, they were convicted as traitors and beheaded. Ha Whoa! They, were, they, they really legitimately killed the messenger. <laughs> Harlem would fight. Don Fadrique arrived at Harlem on the 11th of December 1572. The defenses of the city were not particularly favorable. Their main means of defense, a wall 20 foot high, set with round and low towers and surrounded by a wet ditch, was in bad shape. There was only a single modern outwork, a raveling before the Cruisport. According to Christopher Duffy, this outwork posed many problems to the Spanish and it was one of the first instances where the value of such outworks was proven. This outwork prevented a direct bombardment on the city gate. However, the surrounding area could not be flooded and offered the enemy many places to set up camp and earthworks. Because of this, 
Don Fadrique thought of the town more as an administrative than a military problem. Mm. In mid-December, Willem of Orange attacked the Spanish positions in order to relieve the city from the siege. However, he was unsuccessful and shortly after, the Spaniards cannonaded the wall near the Cruisport for three days. On the 20th of December, they launched a head-on attack on the damaged wall. This was somewhat rushed and unusual because that must have been a hell of a wall to stand up for 20 days. Storm assaults without careful preparation were usually not successful during this time. So, after fierce fighting, the hasty Spanish assault was repulsed by the defenders. By the beginning of 1573, the eyes of both the Duke of Alba and Willem of Orange were fixed on the struggle for Harlem. Meanwhile, Don Fadrique was well aware that encircling the city entirely was impossible because of the size of the town and the river Sparne. It led to the nearby Harlemer Meer, a massive lake, and allowed for food and men to be brought to and from the city, in winter over the ice by sledge, in summer by ship. It also allowed the defenders of Harlem to communicate with the towns of southern Holland and to bring reinforcements and supplies to the city. On the 8th of January, Don Fadrique reported to King Philip, quote, the town is very large, and there is nothing we can do to stop the enemy coming in and going out as they please. That is what makes them put up such a firm defense." End quote. The Spaniards numbered 17,000 to 18,000 men, accompanied by a lot of artillery. However, the continuous fighting, the cold winter and the pervasive diseases shrank these numbers to less than half at some points in time. The numbers were always subject to change because of the fresh troops arriving at the city. The Spanish faced a garrison of 4,000 soldiers, assisted by 2,000 armed citizens. Amongst these was the famous Kenau Simonsdochter Hasselaar, who commanded a company of women defending the walls of Harlem with swords and pikes, cooking oil, burning pitch, as well as bricks and rocks. Kenau was about 47 years old when the siege began, and successfully ran her late husband's shipyard. However, it seems she wasn't particularly popular because she was involved in numerous lawsuits against her fellow citizens. She is often characterized as a plump, hulking woman with male characteristics, and up to this day, a particularly masculine female is described as Vare Kenau in some parts of the Netherlands. After the failure to storm the city in December, the Spanish set about a formal siege. The Spanish trenches slowly wormed towards the ravelin, which was abandoned by the defenders on the 15th of January without resistance. Don Fadrique ordered another assault on the town on the 31st of January. It was repelled in an even bloodier massacre than the one in December. Christopher Duffy notes that the Spanish commanders learned the hard way that it was not advisable to try storming a somewhat decently defended position. In the famous words of Sébastien Le Prestre de Vaubon, probably the most famous siege engineer of the 17th century, quote, haste during a siege does not accelerate the conquest, end quote. That being not enough, the Spaniards made the unpleasant discovery that the people of Harlem had pulled down a series of houses behind the walls to completely entrench the town with a newly constructed resilient bastion system. One downcast Spanish captain desperately noted, quote, Who would believe that we are no further forward than on the first day of the siege? And we cannoned the wall for 20 days. Then we dug our trenches all the way up to the abandoned little outpost. While they were entrenching themselves inside of the city walls so that you couldn't make any steps forward. Talk about damn moral disappointment, Jesus. Because the work of the past three weeks was absolutely fruitless, morale in the badly yeah. frustrated Spanish camp had reached its low and some officers even spoke in favor of abandoning the siege. However, Alba was determined to get hold of the city and nipped the discussion in the bud. Also, rage against the townspeople of Harlem ran high amongst the troops. Many lurked for revenge and accepted the toll of the exhausting fight as a price for their vendetta. The war had become so cruel that there was no question of either side taking a man alive. Once again, 
The Spaniards had no choice but to return to the slow and laborious systematic siege. Despite several sorties of the defenders, they slowly dug their approach trenches and seps towards the new built ramparts above the ground, while their miners fought a subterranean fight against the rebel miners. When they detected an enemy tunnel, they fought a bloody and messy fight in the dark, narrow and muddy corridors of Earth. In the meantime, both sides tried to lower the morale of the other. While the Spaniards executed prisoners in plain sight of the city walls, the defenders placed Catholic statues on the walls and threw some of their lost bread over the walls to mock the hungry attackers. This struggle continued until spring. Harlem remained undiminished. But they were ready at the beginning to just hand it all over. On the 28th of May, the people of Harlem received bad news. The town was completely cut off. A Spanish flotilla coming from the Südersee to the Harlemer Meer had defeated the rebel ships in a sea battle and seized Fort Fuig, a stronghold controlling the entrance to the Harlemer Meer. This changed the situation drastically. The high numbers of defenders turned into a disadvantage as they began to exhaust the stock of the city's granaries. Hunger became the citizens' worst enemy. Soon food had to be rationed, many people began to chew the leather of their shoes and eventually starve to death. On the 9th of July, the Spaniards repulsed the last attempt to relieve Harlem. Four days later, the city surrendered unconditionally. It was spared from plundering, but it had to pay a ransom of 240,000 guilders. Although most of the citizens were spared, the Spaniards executed 1,735 wow. men of the garrison and the leading rebel citizens. After the first few hundred were beheaded by five executioners, who worked until they could lift their arms no more, the rest of the condemned men were bound together back to back and thrown into the river Sparne, where they drowned. Meanwhile, Kenau was able to flee. The fall of Harlem gave the Spaniards a strategic advantage. Rebel-held Holland was now disconnected, as it was cut in a northern and southern part. However, according to historian Peter Gale, quote, The long duration of the siege was almost as serious for the Spaniards as failure would have been. End quote. The delay gave other cities time to prepare themselves, yeah. and the Spanish losses made it clear to all rebels that the Spaniards were far from being invincible. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the staggering siege of Harlem. I'm saying that's a tough ass town right there, all the way up to the end. Inspiring other towns, giving them time. And that is, yeah, I was thinking about that the whole time. This gives other people, while we're so focused here on this little tiny ass city, all the rest of the people are able to kind of build up. They know we they still knew what was going on at first. Cause she could send messages and ships and things out. Had that flotilla never come along, they probably would have never took the city. If you guys enjoyed it, get over show sand Roman history, some love. Smash the like button if you like. Did the dislike button, but something wrong with you. Check out the other video up on the screen. Tell the next one highly combustible. You guys be happy. I'll be safe. I love you to the moon and back. Peace.